Um, my name is Madison Darling. I'm the Executive Assistant here at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, and we would like to welcome you to our offices here in D.C., as well as to those watching on live stream. Uh, we had over a thousand people watching last week, so we're very excited that you're here eating our ice cream and that you guys are with us virtually. Um, so the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, founded in 1962, is the leading national organization addressing the public health crisis of pornography and exposing the links between all forms of sexual exploitation. Nicosi embraces a mission to defend human dignity and oppose sexual exploitation. To this end, Nicosi operates on the cutting edge of policy activism combating corporate and government policies fostering exploitation, advances public education and empowerment, and fosters united action through the leading the International Coalition to End Sexual Exploitation. Our speaker today is Nicosi's Executive Director and Senior Vice President, Don Hawkins. Don is a passionate defender of human rights who has dedicated her life to fighting against social harms that threaten the dignity of others. Her energy, creativity, and mobilization skills have revived the anti-pornography movement. As Executive Director of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, Dawn has developed a national strategy uniting conservatives, women's rights, child advocacy, and religious groups, including bipartisan political leadership, to work together raising awareness of the pandemic harm of pornography. Her initiatives have led to sweeping policy changes that foster exploitation for targets such as Google, Verizon, and the Department of Defense. Through her leadership, Nicosi has grown a network reaching hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. And in addition to her many appearances on local and national television news programs, she regularly authors articles and speaks around the country and the world addressing the harms of pornography and all forms of sexual exploitation. To speaking to you today on the interconnectedness of all forms of sexual exploitation, Nicosi's Executive Director, Don Hawkins. She has so much energy. I guess she ate some ice cream. I haven't had any yet. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope that my remarks today, my goal is to kind of just expand your understanding of sexual exploitation. Um, many of you are working on various issues or areas of in the movement to combat sexual exploitation, and I think we often get kind of pigeonholed or, or sidetracked in whatever that issue is. So if it's pornography or if it's sex trafficking or sexual violence, et cetera, but at the... Um, this is new, so I, this is my first time giving a presentation. You just touch it. <laughs> at, um, like Madison said, here at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, we really strive to make um, the connections between different forms of sexual exploitation. We believe very much that they're often fueling one another and they're causing one another. They're, um, we can't really begin to solve any one of these unless we start to think about how it's connected in other ways. And so today I'm just going to kind of go from issue to issue, connections that I think that we are often overlooking in the hopes that we sometimes in our work on these issues we just look up, we look around the movement and see kind of where we can maybe make allies, where there's some other areas or bodies of research that could help, etc. So. That's my goal today, and it's going to be depressing for most of my talk. Um, so first we want to talk about this, what I, I would argue, and many are, are um, in agreement, this growing problem of child-on-child -child sexual abuse. Um, last week I got a call from an individual who was calling to tell me about a five-year-old little boy who was watching cartoons on YouTube. and. YouTube is a known place with lots of pornography, very violent pornography, and it just pops up un with unrelated searches often. So there's a caveat there. Don't allow children to just run rampant on YouTube because it's really not a safe place. But so this five-year-old little boy was watching cartoons on YouTube, and after um, he got finished watching one, just another video started playing, and it happened to be a pornographic cartoon. And this little boy that evening acted out on a three-year-old little boy. Here we've got, I mean, this five-year-old isn't a bad person, isn't a bad kid at all, but here we have a child perpetrating on another child, and largely because of the example he's seeing from pornography. In this case, it was even cartoon pornography. Um, we have had recently an attorney contact us 
who is representing an eight-year-old girl who was raped by a 13-year-old boy. And it turns out, um, in the course of the sexual abuse, he had her siblings and his siblings watch it. That is straight from pornography, really, this like voyeuristic um, tendency. And, and it came out also that this 13-year-old boy has been struggling a lot with pornography. He's, he's accessing it all the time. Um, these are stories that we hear often, and we're seeing it in the news quite a lot also. And it's like, everyone is like, this is a problem, but we don't know what to do about it. But they're not talking about the fact that these young kids are exposed to hardcore pornography also at these young ages. Um, in the UK, where they are keeping pretty good records on this problem, they have seen a 78% rise in children acting out in ch on children in just four years. Um, in Missouri, so most of our states don't have a, re a law that mandates reporting of this kind of behavior, but Missouri recently passed one last year in which um, children acting out on other children have to be assessed by the state. And in the first five months of that, after that law passed, they thought maybe there would be 600 cases, but there were two th in the year, but there was 2,000 cases in just the first five months. So this is really showing us that there is this growing pandemic of children acting out on children, and it's really new. Um, and so why is this happening? I think we, we need to all kind of wrestle with that. Um, moving on to kind of connections I see between sexting and trafficking. Um, I, I recently met a survivor who shared with me her story, and it, it happened that she met an older man who groomed her and all these kind of ways you probably know about, and he got her to send him naked images of, her, of herself via text message. Um, he then used those images to coerce her into um, having sex with his friends and with other people who he then collected money for in return. He told her that if she didn't do as he said, he was gonna send those images out to everyone at her school, to her family, to others that she really cared about and didn't want to know that she was involved. And it took her three months of kind of going through this, of being sold by this older supposed boyfriend before she had the courage to tell her father who was able to help her. But this, I mean, I got to hear her story personally, but this is like an account that I have started realizing is kind of happening over and over again, where we're seeing anecdotally that many, um, especially young girls, are being coerced through sexting and through that kind of activity. But yeah, no one's talking about this. Largely, my understanding in our schools is they're just telling these young girls don't do this because you're creating child pornography and maybe you'll end up on the sex offender registry. They're not telling the girls really that these images are gonna last forever, that they're gonna be probably shared, that they're gonna end up on third party websites, that they're often often used against them to get them to, to do what they want. Um, there's a study, I, I didn't bring my full notes about it, but this recent study from the Journal of Adolescence talked about how sexting is frequently used as an online extension of offline forms of sexual um, coercion. And so we have to realize it's just another tool in the pimps and the traffickers, the sellers' arsenal right now. Um, and last year, the LA County Sheriff's Department, their Human Trafficking Bureau, had a press conference because they're seeing this rise in sexting connected to reports of trafficking, child trafficking. And um, in that, they gave an update on the number of human trafficking cases that were involving children and young teens who were taking new photos of themselves. And they said that there were 519 cases that they investigated, and in I think it was in a year period. And one in four of those images appeared to be selfies taken by the, the kids themselves. So, Again, this is so important. We have to be talking to our youth, especially, about the role sexting is playing and the further consequences it's having. Um, okay, so stripping, I, maybe I skipped one. Did I? No. 
stripping is also one, you know, so often we look at stripping as just something happening in this seedy place. It's the women are fully consenting, but stripping is a gateway into prostitution. Anita Carter, who has worked with, she works with hundreds of survivors every year. She's with Breaking Free. She said, um, it's the place where the training begins until we as a society recognize all forms of sexual exploitation, including stripping, we will never end the vicious cycle of sex trafficking and prostitution. Um, I have Google alerts set up on all these super depressing topics, you know, that I get every day. And one that I recently saw um, was about a trafficking case out of a strip club. So it was a 14 year old girl who was trafficked by the manager of the strip club. She was forced to strip there and he sold her, he arranged dates for her with customers of the strip club. But that's like not abnormal. This is a normal kind of thing happening in the strip clubs. Um, Dr. Melissa Farley has um, really done a lot of work on prostitution and um, factors leading to, to that issue as well and, and really delved deep into stripping. But one study that she did found that 55% of the sex buyers in her study noted that they located women for prostitution in strip clubs. And 90% of the men she, um, that she interviewed, whether they were buyers or non-buyers, they held the opinion that almost all of the bars um, and strip clubs in Boston sold minor children. I think the buyers and the men who are involved in that, they know where to go to find people for sale, right? And yet we who are trying to combat this problem are often largely overlooking the world, what's happening in these places. Um, and we've seen even our federal government and some state governments making partnerships with strip clubs in the fight against sex trafficking, um, where the sex traffickers are essentially paying, putting money into big funds in exchange for um, the government turning a blind eye and other regulations in the strip clubs. And the money that they're giving is supposed to go to help survivors. But how can you have that when we've got a business model that's really founded on the sexual exploitation of women and when a lot of the prostitution is really happening right out of there? Um, I really highly recommend this book. It's really hard to read. But if you want to understand really the connections between all of these things, I think this book really helps you and it's very moving, especially on the issue of prostitution. Um, but Rachel Moran, she wrote this part and I just can't get it out of my head, but she said, I told all of the men I met at my age at the time, she was 14 at this time, um, she said, I did this for a reason because it had the almost universal effect of causing them to become very aroused and to climax easily, which was good news for me because it meant that the experience was over quickly. How, how horrible is that? And we know that many individuals in prostitution, they enter it when they are teenagers, when they are children. Um, and, and yet the buyers, they're largely turned on by that. They're not trying to help them. But what happens when those girls turn 18? Some of, our, some of the groups working in this realm and some of our policies are just, we're just turning our head and saying we can only focus on the children, but, but those, those girls who have been prostituted since age 13, 14, 15, they're gonna turn 18 and that's still the only thing that they know and they're gonna continue to be prostituted and used and abused and sold. Um, prostitution and sex trafficking are the same human rights catastrophe. I want to like shake you to get that in, there, in everyone's head. But both are part of a system of gender-based domination that makes violence against women and girls profitable to a mind-boggling extreme. Both prey on women and girls made vulnerable by poverty, discrimination, and violence, and it leaves them traumatized, sick, and impoverished. The concerted effort by some NGOs and government leaders to disconnect trafficking from prostitution, to treat them as distinct and unrelated phenomena, it's nothing less than a deliberate political strategy aimed at legitimizing the sex industry and protecting its growth and profitability. And I would just argue whether it's really their concerted strategy or not, we, we just, we can't overlook this connection anymore and start, and we can't think about prostitution and trafficking as though they're separate issues. So, you're with me? 
Did I convince you? Um, I talk, I, I'm talking about uh, sexual assault in the U.S. military because this is kind of a buzz thing that's been in the media a lot over the last couple of years. Um, there has been, have been a lot more reports of sexual violence and sexual assault in our military bases. And many of you probably saw that huge Marine scandal that came out, I think it was in March, where all of these um, revenge pornography photos were being shared on Facebook and there were like tens of thousands of male Marines who were just passing these photos back and forth or between each other. Um, I would argue that we can't begin to address all of the sexual assault and sexual violence in our military unless we start talking about other factors that our military is normalized. So did you know that most bases are surrounded by strip clubs right outside of their bases? They are. And many military members are going and frequenting those strip clubs, whereas we just talked about, we, know, we see underage individuals there, we see prostitution happening there. Um, also, um, the military is selling por hardcore pornography, like they're even peddling it themselves in the Navy, selling it in their base exchanges. And thanks to our organization, I'm so proud of this, we got the Army and the Air Force to stop selling pornography in their bases and also to do regular searches of public and work spots to remove pornography and explicit content there. And that's, I think, a really big step forward, but it doesn't do away with the fact that on our military bases abroad, especially in Afghanistan, Iraq, what we're hearing is the computers are just completely unfiltered and the men are viewing pornography nonstop. So it's creating this culture of normalizing sexual exploitation, normalizing the use and abuse of women. Um, and, and so I would argue that if we want to curb sexual assault and violence in the U.S. military, we have to also begin addressing strip clubs and, and pornography and all these other commercial sex happening. And the same kind of thing is happening I would say in our college campuses, I see so many of you are young, I feel like I wish we could just stop and talk about this for the next hour. But we're seeing a huge rise in reports of sexual assault in our college campuses. And thankfully, everyone's wanting to do something about it. Thankfully, President Obama set up different commissions, Congress is trying to study this, everyone's trying to find solutions. But really, the large solution that I'm hearing come out of everything is to teach consent better. And I think that's good, but that's not everything. We have to recognize that these 21-year-olds, 18-year-olds, have been accessing and been exposed to hardcore violent pornography since their early adolescence. And so that's informing their sexual templates, it's informing how their, for, their expectations with one another, how they think they're expected to act. And so we have to kind of try to undo all of that exposure to the violent, hardcore porn, you know? And it, we can't really solve the issue of, of treating women this way unless we start to change their sexual templates also. Do you have any questions so far about any of the points I've covered? Sorry, online people. What do you mean? It, it, I'm sorry. So if they were to do a search or if they were to have someone illegally selling hardcore pornography or something like that, would they would there be consequences for the person involved or would they just remove the material from the base and say, okay, we'll just take the material out without punishing the person involved? That's a really good question. Um, so the the mili the army and the air force themselves were selling it. They were the sellers, so they stopped selling it, thankfully. Um, but if someone else were to be selling it, see, this is one of the steps we want them to take is that we think that pornography shouldn't be allowed on the government basis at all anyway. So I don't think that there's really an, a set policy, but I don't know for sure. It's really hard to like figure out the U.S. military's policies, but I don't think that they have a set policy yet. But following up on that question, how did you persuade the Army and Air Force to quit selling hardcore pornography? 
Well, so how did we help persuade the Air Force and the Army? Well, the first year time, I think it was in 2014, when they announced this huge surge in sexual assaults, mm -hmm. we, I snuck onto a, I didn't really sneak, someone escorted me, but <laughs> onto a base in San Antonio where my husband was in school, actually. And I took a picture. There were 54 um, of the sexual assault cases taking place just in this one base in Texas. So I went there and I took a picture of the pornography that they were selling and then our, our team stood outside of the Armed Services Committee meeting and handed it to members of Congress. Um, we, we leaked this stuff to the press. It got a lot of media and thankfully we were able to get a lot of kind of grassroots activists contacting, signing petitions, making calls also. And so all of that just turned into this perfect storm that yeah. led to them feeling the pressure. Good. So we just need to do that again a little bit more yeah. on a lot of other issues. <laughs> um, so let me move on a little bit to pornography, prostitution, and sex trafficking. Um, as Madison explained earlier, our organization, I'd say our like niche is really the role pornography is playing in the continuum of sexual exploitation. For, so for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to kind of talk about that issue. Um, many don't think about how prostitution and trafficking is happening actually within the mainstream pornography industry. I have, in my six years, seven years here, I've spoken with about 200 individuals who are working in pornography, either currently or out of pornography, and I feel like every single one of them told me stories about being coerced into it, being drugged, being given lots of alcohol, and then being kind of impressed to do something that she wouldn't have done otherwise had she not been super drunk, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've just heard countless stories of examples that could fit really the definition of sex trafficking, but it's within the mainstream pornography industry. So I, I just want to point out, it's not like they're an up and up industry following really great laws and they're treating everyone on their set well. Um, and so we, we need to think twice about really what's happening in mainstream pornography. But also we're seeing that um, among those who are prostituted and trafficked, often the forced sex acts are being filmed now, and then they're being shared and distributed further. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like the super organized mainstream adult industry, porn industry that's doing it, but we're seeing this just happen now because everyone has their own cameras, their own, you can start your own website. We're seeing sex, um, we're seeing sex traffickers encourage um, the girls to be filmed and then they're even making the girls manage the websites after it. So I would argue that if one is watching pornography regularly on the internet, they're most definitely seeing material of trafficked women and likely underage girls. Um, it's just, you can't tell the difference. There's no way to tell. And the, we're seeing that these kinds of forced acts are also being uploaded to mainstream porn sites like Pornhub, which is just like the YouTube of pornography, and there's no, there's no, there's no way to tell the difference. Um, we're also seeing that pornography is used as a form of advertising very frequently. If you go on Craigslist or Backpage.com, for example, where you can just go buy a woman, um, often pornography is used to kind of advertise her. We're seeing that um, further on on other websites. It's even connected between Instagram and Snapchat. Pornography is being used and then connecting you for where to buy a, a woman. So it's these are so inextricably connected. And I want to point out that mainstream pornography today, the common themes in mainstream, the most popular pornography today include teen themes or child themes. They include incest and rape and extreme violence, almost always directed at the women in the pornography. Um, we're seeing slavery themes just constantly, racism, racist themes, and just really extreme violence. It's become so violent, the mainstream pornography today. Um, if Dr. Gail Dine, she always tells me when she was writing her book, Pornified, another book I recommend to you if you want to learn more about these issues, um, that she did an experiment where she tried to find softcore pornography like a child might do. So she went online and she typed in 
words that a child might type in, hoping to just see maybe topless women. But the first things that she saw were, was, it was extreme hardcore pornography. And I just want to point out that this is what youth, this is what kids are being exposed to. They're not, if they go online, they're not likely just seeing a, top, a picture of a topless woman, which I find that problematic as well. But they're seeing this extreme stuff that we're pointing out immediately. <clears throat> Since 2011, there are 30 neurological studies that point out negative impacts to the brain of pornography. There's a whole host of research. I think next week we're going to get into um, the public health crisis of pornography and some of the public health impacts. So we'll delve more into the brain. But I just want to point out, it's literally changing the brain. It literally affects the chemicals being released by your brain. It um, causes you to seek out harder types of material. You get become bored and unsatisfied with the same thing all the time, which is why we've seen these themes now become the common thing. So I learned that pornography addiction is very real, and the brain science is showing us that addiction is, is a real problem for many people. I'm sorry for this, but I want to point out last Recently, we've got a big campaign against Comcast and Verizon, and we reviewed the titles of things from Comcast. I'll just back up for a minute while I explain this. <laughs> we reviewed the titles available at, for com at, on Comcast recently, and they were just so horrible. I'll show you a few of the titles. Um, but one theme that I, I couldn't believe that there's so much of it was in the theme of incest. Um, look at look at these. These are just two examples. But there are dozens of incest videos on Comcast right now. I mean, here's the ultimate step family mashup packed with stepmom, stepdad, stepdaughter. These, how many people are struggling with sexual abuse at the hands of their step parents? I mean, this is a real crisis, and yet we've normalized and glamorized and made fun and sexualized it. And that's the real hell for so many people in the U.S. We can't even track it because people are afraid. They're not reporting sexual abuse at the hands of a family member. But we know that it's very prominent. It's becoming worse as pornography becomes more prevalent. Here are just a couple of the, uh, titles that Comcast was selling. Um, and then Comcast told us that these are a benefit to consumers. Can you, can you believe it? These extreme violence, racist, many slavery themed, <coughs> lots of babysitter and teen themed kind of films. You know, with as much babysitter and teen themed porn is out there, is it a wonder really that we have so many adults now interested in sex with younger and younger individuals? Is it a surprise? It's not a surprise. We've glamorized it so much in mainstream pornography. So, any questions? <laughs> this, is, this is heavy stuff. It's hard stuff. I'm sorry. But I feel like we have to talk about it. We need to bring it out into the light. We can't keep it hidden in the shadows. Um, our organization, like I said, we work to connect the dots. We see ourselves really focused. We're, I think we're really good at advocacy. We're good at getting companies to change. And, um, and one of the tools by which we do this is our annual Dirty Dozen list. I think you have a copy of it on the table you can take with you. But each year, we come out with 12 targets who we argue are major facilitators of sexual exploitation in the United States. Um, so here's the list for 2017. And... Um, each one has its own little web page with our explanation for why, proof for why, and lots of things that you can do in the general public. Um, we've had so many victories from this. We got Google to change. We got Google to change their policy in Google Play to get rid of um, sexually explicit apps. And we got Google to stop all the explicit advertisements. And that was it's just a huge feat in and of itself. Um, We've got Walmart to stop selling child, uh, eroticized child pornography books, which is crazy that you could um, think that they're selling them. Um, we got 
I'm looking right there, but you're, yeah. <laughs> we have a little poster with some, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. We got, in the last 18 months, we got almost all major hotel chains to stop selling pornography, which is huge, like Hilton, Starwood, I Intercontinental Hotels Group. Um, Twitter recently changed their policy to, it's not super awesome, but finally, I think Twitter is one of the rare social media sites with for pornography and tracking and selling of people. It's, it's really commonly used for that. But Twitter got rid of certain hashtags that are known places where pornography and solicitations for prostitution are being posted. So great. I mean, we've had a lot of success, so I encourage you to join us because the way it works is a lot of people are joining and signing petitions and making calls. And I know that might seem annoying, but it really helps because we've set it up so it's like the emails you're sending are going to their CEO who's annoyed that he's getting so many <laughs> So then he will, he's willing to like, they're willing to, to listen to us and talk to us and opens the dialogue. So we need some more help. Um, we also do a lot here in Washington um, to try to influence um, really getting existing policy enforced better, more efficiently um, through our freedom from sex exploitation agenda. This year we have 16 policy points that we think are really important for our government to implement, whether it's through new legislation or getting different agencies really on board. And it combats demand, <laughs> it combats, um, it, it, it addresses child pornography, pornography, sexual violence, all of those issues. And then the best, especially because maybe if you're all still here in DC, we have started this big coalition of groups, um, almost 300 groups that are joining together. They all work on sexual exploitation issues. Um, and we host this huge summit, usually each year, but it's gonna be next March here in the DC area. And it brings in like all the top leaders, many of the top leaders working on these issues. The best part is it's, I say this because they see lots of young faces. But I think my favorite part is, it's like those of us who are young and newer in this movement, able to work with those who've been working on these issues for decades and we find really great partnerships and mentorships and it's just a fantastic place to learn if you want to work on these issues on longer term so you should come mm -hmm. and I just want to close with this I always close with it so if you've heard me speak you've seen it but it's my friend's great-grandparents on their 83rd wedding anniversary and he's 104 and she's 101 isn't mm -hmm. that so amazing and I just this is what is driving me. I feel like if we can fight for real love, like that's what it's all about, for the dignity of each one of us and for real love, we can really have true happiness. But all these things that I've been talking about, they take away from this. And so let us just leave with this hope that we can defend this and protect it and help others to have it, hopefully. So any, I think I, Madison, you can. Yeah, thank you so much, Don, for this wonderful talk. answers. Um, so if anyone has any questions, also we need to repeat it back for our live stream viewers if they're still on. Uh, does anyone have anything? Can we bring out the ice cream? Yes. Mm -hmm. and There's more ice cream. Were those movie titles on Comcast, were those ones that were like pay-per-view or on-demand or were they just like on TV? Yeah, they were on there. They're on-demand. Yes, if. Hello, everyone there. I see a lot of questions there. Sorry. Um, yes, if the titles I showed on about Comcast were just available on Comcast or if they're on, through their on demand. And it's through their on demand. I do want to say we've been working on kind of that issue. And Verizon made a pretty significant change this year. Similarly, so their change is that all new customers starting in January of this year have to actually call and ask for the porn channels if they want it. So they have to opt in which is a great deterrent, right? And also we know, we're happy because then kids aren't gonna stumble across these. Because I think the titles themselves and the descriptions are are bad enough. I don't want my little kids to have to see that, right? So I'm happy that Verizon made that change and it's not enough yet, but and it's a big victory. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, it seems like the YouTube algorithm will somehow suggest uh, hardcore pornography after a normal view, like, um, 
how would you suggest Google, like what actions are you going to take? Does it need to change their algorithm or is there an easier way to check whatever is happening? I'm not as smart as the people at Google. So I can't, okay, the question was, how could Google improve their algorithms in YouTube? Well, first of all, Google's policy, YouTube's policy is that this material is not allowed, but they're really not putting in any effort to filter it out or to remove it. They rely only on the users to report it. And it's actually a very complicated way that you have to report it. You actually have to watch it and then you report it and you have to fill out this form to Google and tell them exactly where you saw and what you saw, which forces the user then to like have to be exposed to this stuff and you can't just hit a flag and, and, and move on. So that's one thing we, we're we really insisting that Google fix. I mean, they can't possibly keep up with the amount of content being uploaded by mm -hmm. their users perfectly. But if we could flag it better, that's one thing. Um, two, they, they could build solutions, certainly. I mean, they created so many amazing products already. But I think they're, they're, they, we've met with Google, and they even told us, essentially, we're not going to do anything about YouTube. That's really what they told us. But they did make YouTube for kids. So for families with young kids, I really always recommend that. And I have looked hard, and I never found anything bad in that app, so it's called YouTube for Kids. Also, within YouTube, you can turn on Safe Search, and I really admonish everyone to turn this on. It's not perfect. You'll still be exposed to some material maybe you wouldn't want to be, but it's it's pretty good at filtering out those things. So if that Safe Search could work that way, why can't it just take out the videos that are already in, um, that are not, you know, are breaking their terms of use? So. I don't know the exact answer, but I think the genius is that Google should put in some work and figure it out. Two more questions. Let's go back there. And then... oh. Hi, um, so I noticed that Snapchat is both on the victory and on the dirty dozen list, and I can like assume why, because they really haven't done too much yet, and I was wondering if you have gotten contact with um, probably the most ominous uh, publisher on Discover Vice, because every other day they're publishing something that normalizes sex workers. Or um, my dad like, is a critic for pornography. Like, I don't judge him, it's great. Um, so if you've reached out to them at all, I'm not sure they'd be too open to listening, but. <laughs> yeah, Vice is interesting. So the question is uh, regarding Snapchat, thinking maybe if we reach out to a content publisher, Vice, who's very popular there, we, we have not really reached out to Vice other than they get our press statements and sometimes they cover our issues. And sometimes, actually, they cover it on our side, but a lot of times they cover it on the other side. I think that's a good idea. I think maybe the next tactic, and if you have any ideas for any of our targets, share, um, but maybe the next tactic is going after some of the bigger publishers creating that content. That's a good idea. We already going after Cosmo, but yeah. Any other? Yeah. Sugar, day, sugar Daddy apps, did, did those go away? I know you could find them on Google Play, and I know that some college students were using them to get tapes and... Yeah, so she's asking about the Sugar Daddy apps that pair young people with someone older who has a lot of money in exchange for usually a sexual relationship. Um, I. I don't know actually if they're st if they're on Google Play now. That's a good thing to investigate. But that actually leads me. I wanted. Do I have like two minutes? Two minutes. Mm -hmm. I forgot. I wanted to talk a little bit about EBSCO Information Services, which is one of our targets for Dirty Dozen. And I I just think that this is really the biggest scandal mm -hmm. that I've seen since I've been working on these issues. So EBSCO is this online library research database. Many of you maybe used it in college um, or in work now. It's kind of like LexisNexis, if you know. But mm -hmm. almost all K-12 through schools subscribe to EBSCO's online research databases for their schools. And there's a few other similar databases. And what we found is that these databases are full. They're riddled with sexually explicit content. In the elementary school, middle school, the high school level, and it's even worse because what we found is it's this explicit content is popping up with really unrelated innocent searches. So like you type in seventh grade biology and like the third recommend we found was an article strongly recommending 
that, and it was like cartoon drawings, and it was recommending that the readers engage in public anal and group sex, and it gave tips for how to like entice a girl to in, get involved in that. I mean, and I, we found so much more. So we have a whole thing on our website about EBSCO, but what you said, so one of the, one of the things I found also was articles normalizing prostitution, and um, especially normalizing these daddy, sugar daddy relationships, which is terrible to tell a 15-year-old girl and get this in her mind and make her think that this is the way to empowerment, this is the way to achieve all your dreams, just act as this kind of sugar baby for someone else, you know? And so I just encourage you all, we're, in, we're talking with EBSCO and trying to fix things there, but most people don't comprehend that this is happening in our schools. It's bypassing the school filters. It's hard to, like, for a lot of parents to wrap their heads around because they're not familiar with online research databases. Um, those librarians and school administrators are believing that these um, pro programs are already age and curriculum appropriate because that's how it's being sold to them. So it's just, I mean, isn't this horrible? And as we're all trying to combat sexual exploitation and here we are grooming these young people our, our most vulnerable into accepting it. And so I invite you to join us and help us fight and win and connect all these dots. And thanks for your time. Thank you so much. And um, we will be going over more of these points throughout the summer. Next week, pornography is a public health crisis, understanding the impacts on the body and the brain. We're going to talk more on child sexual abuse. We're going to talk more on these different areas. But in the meantime, while we'd encourage you to come back to those and to take action and to come to our coalition, we'd also encourage you to eat more ice cream. So it is available. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us online. Bye.